Uh, Laura's on assignment, doing things to uplift young ladies with Envision Fest. You got Rosenberg, and you got our friend, friend of the show, actually. Oh, yeah. Jamal Bowman back on the program, running for office up there in District. What is that, 16? New York 16. New York 16, correct, yes. That's right, Our our one of our state representatives on the federal level. Yes, that's a good way to put it. That's exactly right. State rep on the federal level. That's well, right. and, and the reason I do that is because sometimes people forget that there are state representatives on the state level and then there are state representatives on the federal level that sit in the House. And I think we, we have to not uh, gloss over the reality that many of our uh, uh, American citizens don't know how the government is structured or work. Man, please talk about it. And I appreciate you for continuing to break that down for people because we got city level, county level, state level, federal level, and all this stuff in between that people don't really talk about, but it, but it's really important to your day-to-day -day lives. And we got school boards. People need to be well, part yeah, of the school true. board. And, then you got bur school board. and in New York City, you got borough level. That's right. That's exactly right. That's you know exactly what I mean? right. Man. So, uh, Jamal Bowman, let's get to the hot topic, man. You're you're running for office and you have a highly contested district and a highly contested seat in the House. You are a progressive in the Democratic caucus. And uh, we have had you on several times because of that, because we love how you're pushing things forward and looking for new solutions and not afraid to call people to task. Currently, and over the last few months since October 7th, you've been very outspoken about a ceasefire. Uh, and the You know the what that means, Ebro? That means he's become a target of APAC. Oh, uh, APAC is on him, <laughs> donating to his donating to his uh, competitor, Latimer, who is, isn't he? He's involved in Westchester County in some way already. Oh, no, he's the Westchester County executive and has been for the last seven years. So people know him, people like him. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a uh, this is a tough one for you. But I just recently saw uh, a poll. I think it was New York Times uh, that said uh, two thirds of your district want a candidate that supports a ceasefire as opposed to Latimer, who does not. That's correct. I mean, people want peace, man. You know, that's that's the bottom line. People want peace. They want an end to not just this war, but all wars. Uh, people are watching on their social media, uh, you know, babies being bombed, you know, kids starving to death. They're watching the atrocities of war and conflict. And so the only way to get to a sustainable, safe space and place for both Israelis and Palestinians and both uh, the Jewish people and the Muslims and Christians who live out there is to get to a place of peace. And so this is something that people have been fighting for for 75 years. This is this is not new. You know, people have been fighting, you know, against the occupation, against the blockade um, and really like pushing conversations around U.S. foreign policy and where our money goes and, and what's it supporting and what we are not like holding our our allies accountable for. And so all of that came to a head um, on October 7th with the uh, you know atrocious attacks uh, by Hamas, which we condemned outright from the very beginning. But since then, what we've seen is collective punishment. We've seen the strategic cutting off on food and water and electricity. And very quickly, we called for a ceasefire because we we saw the writing on the wall, if you will. Like we knew that we would get to this point. I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu who is not liked in Israel and is not liked here at all, was using biblical references at the very beginning to pretty much, you know, tell us what he was going to do and foreshadow what he was going to do. And so, yes, the majority of the district, you know, want a ceasefire. And, you know, that, that should be common sense to most people who care about human rights. But unfortunately, my opponent is not there yet. Now, is he not there yet because he wants to see? Or is he truly, you truly believe that that's where he comes from? Because he knows he can get funding uh, from the warmongers um, who who have, uh, and, I, and I'll let Rosenberg speak to this, uh, about like what the, the gain is actually in having this conflict in the first place. Because we got to get into that also with settlers and Gaza and the waterfront. And, you know, Rosenberg is, is uh, very close to this. And we've talked about this on the air for many, many years. But what do you think your opponent's real, honest, personal position is on this? I mean, he's under the control of APAC. 
I mean, that is crystal clear. He was recruited by APAC even before October 7th and pretty much begged to run for this seat. Mm -hmm. And so he's controlled by APAC. He's a tool of APAC. And just so everyone's clear, he's a Democrat running against me in a Democratic primary. And APAC is funded by Republican GOP mega donors. And they have funded and supported election denying Republicans in the House of Representatives. So I just want to be clear about this. This person has been over his career, a Democrat, 35 years, but now he is signing with APAC, who cares uh, more about, you know, another country than they do here. And he's signing with Republicans uh, who tried to take the election by force in 2020. This is who he's siding with to run against the first black man, first person of color in US history to be in this seat. I mean, he received $600,000 in four weeks from APAC when he launched his campaign and another half a million from Republicans. And he's doing fundraisers with Trump mega donors and Wall Street fraudsters. I mean, this is corruption and big money and politics one-on-one. And it has nothing to do with the people of Yonkers, the Bronx, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, it's all about the most powerful and wealthiest in my district, unfortunately. Well, and, and Rosenberg, before you jump in, I think it should be pointed out these strange bedfellows and this weird axis Venn diagram that we talk about, right? Because taking Jabal, Jamal Bowman's seat away from him now reduces the progressive power in the house so even if you aren't aligned or don't care about what's going on in israel you just want to make sure someone like jamal bowman with a voice and a perspective like jamal bowman's is out of the house that could stand in the way of the marjorie taylor greens and their agenda and these other conservative agendas in the house and you can get in a more moderate democrat that is in the pockets of some of these gop people to maybe abstain or not vote on things or fall back when needed you don't have that extra seat there that that's right and and black and brown people and young people uh don't have a voice in congress that they really support because when you look at the polling it's crystal clear like people under 50 uh people of color real progressives support us like extremely at an extremely high level and so that's what they're trying to take out. I mean, since I've gotten in, and to your point, let's take the Israel issue aside. We've been fighting for universal health care, uh, universal child care, housing as a human right, fully funding our public schools, economic development, and investing in historically marginalized community communities. All the things that people want when you look at Poland, we've been fighting for those things. But special interests in the power elite and big money in politics controls all the politics, Republican and Democrat alike. And so that's why I get you know pushed back from my party as well, as we can see with this primary challenge that we have. I feel like, Jamal, this subject is such a, an interesting case study in, in what is such a major flaw about government as we know it. Because APAC has literally turned from being a primarily Democrat-based PAC to now basically all Republicans, because all of these issues, these are all just one issue people. That's the, they only have one agenda, and that agenda seems to be whatever Israel wants, they support. I'm just confused, though. When, when people give you pushback on this subject, is it just as simple as we want you to blindly support Israel? What could AIPAC even be arguing is good about this war for the future security of our beloved ally, Israel? Uh, yeah, it's thank you for that question and thank you for phrasing it that way. It's been the conflation of criticism of Israel with anti Semitism. That has been the thing. That is what has been weaponized over the years. Israel is a state for the Jewish people. Everything we do is on behalf of the Jewish people. If you criticize Israel, you're criticizing the Jewish people. And you know that couldn't be further from the truth, uh, because to criticize a state is to criticize how that government functions and operates as it rega as regards to its policy. Nobody's saying, by the way, nobody says yeah. the same. Nobody says you're... Uh, 
you're critiquing Islam when that's you, where I was when going. You criticize that's exactly Saudi where I was Arabia. Going with it. That's where I'm going. So when I criticize the U.S., same thing, policy. When I criticize Saudi Arabia, Arabia policy, China policy, it's all about the policy. And as it relates to the issue of anti-Semitism, I believe very strongly, and scholars believe this. And listen, I'm not just talking out my ass here. Like I, I did my homework when I ran against Congressman Elliot Engel because he was the number one pro-Israel chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee person in Congress that I knew I had to run against. So I did my homework and I met with scholars and researchers here. But I also went there to Israel and I met with scholars in Israel, in Jerusalem. And I went to the West Bank and I went to Ramallah and Hebron and met with uh, former IDF soldiers as part of a break in the silence program to hear them tell. So I'm not just talking. Like, I'm trying to figure out, okay, we've been saying two-state solution. When are we going to make this happen? And then when I went there, I was like, oh, y'all not really serious about that. We have 700,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank that are supposed to be Palestinian land. Y'all not, this is just a talking point for y'all. And so for me, the safety and security of the people of Israel is directly connected to the safety and security of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And if we're talking about one without the other, we're not having real conversations. Correct. And with regard to anti-Semitism globally, I'm an educator, so I'm biased towards education. All we're doing politically is pandering to this notion of criticizing Israel as anti-Semitic, as opposed to doing the real work on the ground in schools, in school districts with people to really deal with the issue of anti-Semitism, hate, sexism, and all the shit that continues to hold us back. All the isms. So all the isms. You know what's fascinating? I um I remember about a year ago, whenever whenever Netanyahu was reelected the last time. My dad sent me an article from Tom Friedman, and my dad has never seen things the same way as Tom Friedman. Tom Friedman was always further right than my dad, always was, you know, pretty, pretty hard line for Israel. Well, and, looking, and Rosenberg, you're assuming that people know who your dad is. Sorry, my, me, and my father writes on this subject and has for 50 years, right? I, I recommend everyone go look for his substack, MJ Rosenberg, uh, on the Endless Crisis is the name of his, uh, his substack that he writes on every day. So I just looked up Thomas Friedman on the New York Times, like his you know page where you could see all of his articles. Starting so long before October 7th, months and months before that, this guy who was generally pretty right on Israel started writing— by right, you mean conservative. Correct. Uh, February 28th, 2023. Netanyahu is shattering Israeli society. March 7th, 2023, American Jews, you have to choose sides on Israel. March 14th, 2023, Putin and Netanyahu show why bad things happen to bad leaders. March 28th, 2023, Jamal, Netanyahu cannot be trusted. This is Thomas Friedman, who is a conservative, writing Way back before October 7th. So it's really upsetting. And I wonder if you if you get into this with some of your fellow Democrats who are following sort of the APAC line on Israel is don't you realize this is a far alt right government and we've known that for a while now. Well, and the Israeli citizenship has been protesting this government up until October 7th, until it became, you know, obviously yeah. there was a, a war going on and people got out of the streets. Well, he, the man was trying to wipe out the power of the judiciary branch in Israel. <laughs> and, not, and not just protesting, protesting in the hundreds of thousands every weekend. They were full in the streets uh, protesting uh, Netanyahu's uh, government. And yes, he, he trying to wipe out the judiciary, which is the only branch of government that could hold him accountable for what he wanted to do, which was annex the West Bank, which is what he said out loud. And so to your question, um, big money controls politics. APAC has a very strong arm in the United States uh, Congress, in the House and the Senate. Um, no one wants to be criticized of being anti-Semitic. And and when you when you challenge APAC, uh, brother, like the calls I get in my office are out of control. Like the the calls, the letters, the emails. Like my office stops functioning. 
because we have to respond to all of the incoming, the intimidation tactics, the bullying, uh, again, the weaponization of, of being uh, against Israel. All of that happens. And my colleagues, many of them don't want to deal with that. Like my colleagues, a lot, you know, with no, not all of them, many of them, their goal is to not have a primary race. If I didn't say anything, I wouldn't even be in the primary right now. I, I would, I would just be chilling, coasting to a, a victory in my third term because many, uh, and and it's built on seniority, right? So the longer you stay, the more power you have, the more influence you have. So why do I want to put myself in a position where I may get, where I may lose a race and then not have any influence in the House of Representatives? And that's why we need full democracy reform from <laughs> from the filibuster, the Senate, to to electoral college, to big money in politics to all of it, because all those old ways of doing things got us in a position where we might have a real fascist back in the White House uh, in November. And so, yeah, man, that's the fight. This is not just, you know, Israel and, and the state of Israel, not the people, APAC, um, what's happening in the U.S. with Trump, uh, Western, you know, societies. This is all part of how things used to be and us evolving and transitioning to a world uh, and a country that really works for all people. Now, Jamal, how does how did the temperature change? I don't in any way when Chuck Schumer ca came out unequivocally against Netanyahu and the government, the current, I guess. Well, how does the government work there? Because I really don't know how. Like, is he like uh, I thought he got voted out. Then he got back in. Then he, I, I don't understand it, but. The current clear current leader of uh, Netanyahu in Israel, Chuck Schumer, the highest ranking, not only Democrat in Congress, but also a Jewish man. Yeah, so it changed uh, considerably. Um, I got a ton of text messages from people in the district saying, like, you was right. You was right. You know, now Schumer's on board. This is going to be good for you. This is going to be good for us. And, you know, people could feel sort of the tides changing a little bit. I mean, even um, a couple of weeks prior, I believe it was VP Harris who called for at least a temporary ceasefire, right. which we had not heard the White House say that out loud uh, up until that point. And then President Biden was critical of, of the state of Israel in his State of the Union. We had not seen that before. Right. So right. there is a shift happening, obviously not fast enough because we have over a million people starving to death and that's horrific. Um, but it is shifting. And in the district, um, you know, the majority of the people were kind of already there on ceasefire when, when we called for it. Now, as it relates to the, you know, pro-Israel community in the district, that there, there hasn't been much of a shift because for them, you know, my opponent is their guy and that's just the way it's going to be. And, and, you know, anyone who, but, who goes but based on that, the information you have, if everybody yeah. shows up to the polls to vote, correct, they need, they need more people. Well, 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 this is the critical point here. Like this race is going to really illuminate how serious we are about saving our democracy, but also building power in certain communities. Because if young people show up, if people of color show up, if real progressives show up, we win and we win convincingly. But they have to register. They have to register as a Democrat, which is problematic for people. But they got to understand in New York State, to vote in a primary, you got to be registered with a party, Republican or Democrat, to vote in the primary. We could get into that on another call. But they got to be registered, registered as a Democrat. They got no election day. is June 25th, not election day, November seven for whatever it is. And then they got to go out and vote or vote early or vote by mail-in ballot. And, you know, again, the reason why I ran, the reason why I try to govern the way that I do is to make sure people understand like the stakes of being involved or not being involved. When we're not engaged and not involved, you got people in office. That's why I ran for office. Ingle was dead 31 years. Only 20,000 people were voting this guy into office every year. And Making how many people live in the million, district, just to give an example? 440,000 registered Democrats. Only 20,000 had voted for him the, 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 the campaign before I ran. 
making billion, multi-billion dollar decisions that impact the people in this district. Mm -hmm. The reason why we don't have affordable housing and all the stuff that we know we deserve and want and demand and pay taxes for is because of the people in office. You got people in office who side with APAC and, and special interests. They're not fighting for the people uh, in, in Mount Vernon and Yonkers. Let me just say one more thing real quick. My opponent and, and Rosenberg, you're going to like this. Okay. My opponent, when he returned from Israel after October 7th, he said it's the first time he ever saw bullet holes in his life. My man is a county executive in Westchester County, which includes Mount Vernon and Yonkers. Yonkers. You ain't seen no bullet holes. You ain't, you ain't been through Yonkers. But well, what that tells me <laughs> is when there's a shooting in your own county, you don't show up. What that tells me is you do not have an anti-gun violence initiative, anti-poverty initiative, and you know, for you don't have initiatives that deal with working class people on your agenda as the county executive, which by the way, the county executive is like the president of the county. People don't know this. That like they they have a 2.3 billion dollar budget to disseminate. You had to go to Israel to see bullet holes. Well, listen, we don't want to see bullet holes anywhere. But I know about the, the the rising gun violence that happened in Mount Vernon and Yonkers and, you know, where black and brown people live when I first got in because it was COVID. People were stressed. It was all kind of crazy stuff going on. You 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 had to go to Israel to see that? Crazy. Wow. Crazy. And he said that shit out loud. Like it was like because he's pandering. He's pandering to a lobby while ignoring the black and brown people in his district. He he posted on Instagram yesterday after he did a, a BS gun violence photo op, like he'd been doing stuff on this, he ain't been doing anything, but he posted on his Instagram, gun violence is not a top issue in Westchester County. Mm. What? That tells you right there where his mindset is. He used to live in Mount Vernon, he lives in Rye right now. And talk to the victims of gun violence and the people who live in Yonkers, uh, you know, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, different places. Talk to them and see what they their day to day lives are like, and tell them it's not an issue in our in our district. Now, well Jamal, said, um, since being on the job, let's talk about some of the uh, wins in the win column. I remember having you on some years ago uh, when Biden got elected um, uh, with regard to funding coming into. Uh, school districts in Westchester County and money that had been kind of held up since 2016 that was able to get, uh, you know, shook a loose, let's say, uh, and, and, and the, the coffers were opened up to be able to get funding into the school system in Mount Vernon, into the school system in Yonkers to get much needed upgrades and things happening in the community. How did that go? Um, how are things going? Talk to us about the money you were able to pull from the federal government into your district. I mean, it's it's been incredible. Uh, we've been able to bring well over a billion dollars uh, into the district uh, to invest in everything from workforce development to affordable housing to education to criminal justice reform to climate justice, every category, every area that we wanted to focus on, we've been able to focus on. And our, and our mission has been very clear from the beginning. The areas that have been historically neglected, we are going to invest there because it, it, it solves two problems. One, when we talk about the root causes of violence, the root causes stem from poverty and lack of economic opportunity and also connect to mental health and substance abuse. So we made sure to invest there. And it's not just about money, man. It's about relationships. So, for example, the Westchester Youth Shelter uh, works uh, as an alternative to incarceration program for young men and women who, you know, commit a crime and need to be held accountable. Instead of putting them in jail, let's give them an alternative to incarceration program. Great program. What was missing was the investments in mental health and substance abuse that those young people needed to help put them on the right track. So we partnered them with a program called the CARES program in New York City, uh, gave them over a million dollars in investment, and now they're merging to form the second CARES program in the country that combines criminal justice reform with education with mental health supports. So it's things like that. 
it's also about you know the economic development aspect of it so it's help them with what they need now mental health education um substance abuse but then put them on a pathway to workforce development. So we've invested in workforce de development programs at the YWCA, uh, the HOPE program in the Bronx, environmental leaders of color, because we're focusing on environmental justice and uh, the 21st century technological skills they're gonna need. Uh, we've been able to do all of that. So it's not just the money, it's the relationships and the communities and the programs that my opponent and many elected officials have completely ignored because they don't, they're not creative in their thinking and innovative in their thinking. And it's in response to things that happen in the community. Young man gets, gets shot and killed in New Rochelle with a ghost gun. We write a letter to President Biden giving him six or seven things he could do through executive action. One is banning ghost guns. What does the president do? He bans ghost guns. A girl gets stabbed and killed in Mount Vernon. Um, we don't just show up and give thoughts and prayers. We meet with the youth bureau there and we develop a program for at-risk girls. We give them a million dollars to implement this program. And now they're targeting at-risk girls in middle and high school and just giving these girls self-esteem, self-worth, technical skills and everything they need. While also doing infrastructure projects in some of the other parts of the district like Hastings, Mamaronek, Arsley, and Tuckahoe. So, so, so that's the work, right? The work is one, you know, it's about the people in the district that have been neglected and left behind, but two, it's aspirational. Like what's the vision for this district and how do we work to make that happen? That is the kind of thing when you get people like us into office that we're going to fight for, that we're going to, that we're going to do. Cause guess what? We don't got to go across the world to see bullet holes. I lost five friends to gun violence in Sessions House before I was 21 years old growing up in New York City during the crack cocaine era. That's what that's why you need people like us in office to do this work. Now, how does this bode with the kind of let's call it the old political guard in your district? Right. There was a, I read an article that there were some uh, clergy members and leaders and things like that that felt like they weren't. Uh, they weren't aligned in your plans and policy, but they represented kind of the older generation of the district versus this kind of young movement. Can you talk about how you've been trying to bring those worlds together and having any success? Yeah, um, there is a generational gap for sure. Um, I've had multiple uh, clergy breakfasts and clergy conversations. We just had another one this past Saturday. We're gonna do a few more. Um, um, going forward. And there, there's generational divides and there's ideological divides. Some tend to be a bit more conservative. For example, you know, when it comes to criminal justice reform, many think I may go a little too far with some of the things that I've said as it relates to uh, police violence and other things. And so it, it's about building relationships, making connections, see if we can find common ground. Um, one thing, you know, I feel pretty confident about is when it comes to speaking up for for black and brown and poor and, and 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 progressive people, like you know, I'll put my record up against anybody, and that's something that all clergy, regardless of age or ideology, really align themselves to, and they also align themselves to like my background, right? Like I I didn't just you know raised a single mom and all that, like I said before, but I was an educator for twenty years before doing this. You know, I was a teacher. Uh, high school dean of students and middle school principal for 10 years. So I, like, I, I've already served the community for multiple decades daily through education and other means. So they really appreciate that uh, I bring that perspective to this work because that perspective always begins with the most vulnerable and always invest in education as the ultimate equalizer. That's why we used to go so hard with, with, with the issue of universal child care, man. Yo, people, we, we talk about housing. Child care is like a mortgage payment, yo. Yeah, it it's is. crazy out here. And so people are underemployed, which means they're not making enough money. And then they got to pay child care and rent. Their money's gone. And then when they want to take a vacation, when they get a vacation, they got to use credit to do that. And then their credit turned up back. And and we didn't talk about groceries and all that what, stuff. What, what vacation? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? And so, you know, we fight hard for universal child care, universal pre-K. Um, paid leave, 
uh, home care, investing in special education, all of that, because it's that holistic approach that really helps communities to create the ecosystem to thrive. Mm. And again, this is foreign language to many of my colleagues in office, including my opponent, because a lot of them just they're just in office to keep things going the way they are. Status quo. And why would we why would we want to do that if we just had President Trump and we might get him again? And he's talking about deporting, you know, deporting brown people and and deporting the radical left and bring it back to Muslim ban. Like what we're doing ain't working. We got to do other things. His name is Jamal Bowman. He represents New York 16, a uh, highly right contested does. seat up there in the house. Uh, and a friend of the show, man. We're proud of you, man. I got to say, like, you know, you, there was a, there was a couple of crazy moments. It was you and Marjorie Taylor Greene. He was going to punch <laughs> some dude in the face in the in the house. Something was going. Me and Rosemary was like, nah, we got to call our guy, man. He can't be <laughs> roughing people up up there, man. What's going on, man? But, I, but yo, but I felt you, though. But I felt uh, you. I, I, listen, I appreciate that. Please always reach out to to recalibrate me if you need to. Okay, it, it's okay. Send me a text. Recalibrate me. Make sure I'm good. Well, and, and I'm sure, like I'm sure, you see some of the behavior in the house, and you're like, "How is this happening? Like, who are these individuals? How is this happening? How is this decor? Like, how is this on? Like, what is going yeah. on?" Yeah, I sit with, so we, like the squad, me, Summer, Corey, Alex, Ayan, all of us, we kind of sit together in the house. What's most frustrating for me is everybody in there is has high capacity, capacity and is completely capable of doing great work. But it's like so many other political factors that stops us from doing it, that it becomes very frustrating. Like we could be doing way more historic work for the country, but we're not doing it yet. But I still think we got time to make it happen. Jamal Bowman, thank you, man. Uh, and and I, yes, I'm, I'm guessing it's March. You said voting is in June 25th. June 25th and is my uh, primary. Still- that's not that's not like the presidential primary. Presidential primary is in a couple of weeks. The congressional primary is June 25th. Yeah, they, they do a great job making sure people have to go out to vote four or five times a year. Five, that's what five. everyone needs. No, New York State's a disaster, bro. It's a disaster, man. All right, we'll, y'all. We'll peace and love. The word. Thanks, Jamal. Respect, sir. Take Thank care, you. Bro.